Good morning, everyone. I am Suzanne Lane. I am the director of uh, Family Star. And today we're going to be doing six workshops. And uh, these workshops are going to be on caring for the caregiver uh, and reducing that uh, stress and burnout. We'll also be talking about uh, nutrition and health. Then we will be discussing uh, self-determination. We'll also be talking about the Affordable, the Affordable Health Care Act. And we'll be talking about that health care transition and what does it mean uh, to me as a parent. And then also we'll be talking about understanding health care coverage and what is it that I need to know as a parent. Um, First off, we're going to start with uh, caring for the caregiver and talking about uh, tips in reducing stress and burnout. I want to welcome you to our series um, that we're going to be presenting today. Um, and thank you for being here with me. And I hope that you're able to watch live, if not uh, later at the comfort of your own home. Uh, a little bit about, um, about Family Network on Disabilities. Uh, we uh, do not act as attorneys. Uh, we do not act as uh, health care providers. Uh, I'm a parent of uh, children with uh, special health care needs. And uh, we provide uh, supports for families. Uh, we have been the um, FND has been the uh, statewide parent to parent since 1985. And the value of uh, families getting the support by networking with other families, it's built into everything that we do. We'll often get calls from family members uh, uh, who just need to talk. And so we're there to listen. What we do is uh, we provide information. Uh, even though we log in over 15,000 calls a year, um, we log these in. These, these are coming not only from families, but they're coming from professionals who are just looking for more information. We have a large database of resources uh, for the state of Florida and a library filled with disab disability related information. So regardless of the question that you may have, our staff is going to go that extra mile uh, to answer that question. So if we don't know it, we'll be talking with others that will help us find that information for you. And we always strive uh, to identify options. And part of what we're doing with these workshops today is we're providing you with other options uh, or options you may already know about but haven't thought about lately. Uh, we're always striving to identify those. And um, it's not our role when we're providing these options. It's not our role to tell you what is best for you. It is our role to provide those uh, options to you and encourage you to do best what's best for your family. Now, Family Star has uh, is uh, federally funded uh, from HRSA, the uh, Health Resource Services Information um, Administration, and also um, that is the information uh, we're uh, part of a larger umbrella, which is called uh, Family Voices. So every state has a Family Voice uh, chapter, and uh, we are that family-to-family -family, uh, health information center for the state of Florida. So not only will you find PTIs through every state, because they are federally funded under uh, Office of Special Education. So it's always good information to know about and understand how, where that all comes from. So when we're talking about caring for the caregiver, uh, what, what is the definition of a caregiver, right? It's a family member, a friend, or a neighbor who takes care of a frail or disabled person. Raising a child is incredibly satisfying and an important responsibility. However, when parents of special needs children know that caring for a child requires requires further assistance for the disability that creates its own kind of challenges. And we all know how very difficult that can be. So what is uh, caring for the caregiver? Uh, we're kind of the sandwich generation. Uh, we can fall in 
we can be in the 30s or 40s, we can be responsible for bringing up our own children and that the care of our aging families as well. So it, it does continue to look a little bit different for us. So it's very important um, when we're trying to do the juggling act, we want to, um, in raising our families, we want to uh, get assistance with um, personal care. Um, and even as we're raising our children, we, we want to think of coordinating like soccer games with ballet practices and grocery shopping. But if you're a parent of a child who is sick or has special needs, your schedule most likely involves things such as bathing, grooming, toileting, exercise, shopping, um, food preparation, phone calls, finances, mobility, uh, supervision um, with that emotional support, providing constant companionship and generalized supervision. Being that stable companion and supporter in all personal matters and health related. We might be overseeing medical uh, medications and prescriptions, appointments, uh, administrating me medicine for our child. So there's a lot of things that we are juggling and trying to figure out. So it's important to realize that you're really not alone. So according to the CDC, about one in six children ages three to 17 has one or more developmental disabilities. So if you're caring for a special needs child, these caregiver support tips can provide you with the confidence you need to be the best parent that you can. So when I share an armor, which is my worn by many uh, warrior mothers and fathers, uh, I'm also a parent of a child with a disability. So we are faced with no other choice but to protest, you know, protect wearing this shield and it kind of, it's an invisible shield that we want to uh, go forward with and, and deal with the challenges that we have. And it's so important appreciating those small things that in life, you know, as a parent with a child with a disability, you may feel like you've been challenged in, into a different frequency. And, and once we appreciate these very simple things, um, that helps us, you know, it, it's like um, it, it has our, our morning periods, our, everything has a deeper meaning because we become caring and loving and considerate of others. And I think that you'd agree that even if we found a deeper meaning to life, understanding of human emotions, we can recognize distress very quickly in our children. It's a learned response to people in need. It's something that, that we have in within us in 365 days a year it, it's hard for others to understand that our normal is different to others we consider everyday activities like going shopping to the park or getting ready for school each day every day 365 days a year it looks so different so as caregivers, we often give too much of ourselves. We give everything. We often have nothing left for, for myself or ourselves. We, our loved ones become our life's priorities. We often think that we would believe that our lives would be crazy. And sometimes it's so out of line. So the caregiver journey is special. It's full of emotion. It's full of ups and downs. And sometimes this journey creates imbalance. So this presentation is going to help identify some key parts and help you measure for balance. So we want to look at that. What does it look like? So up to this point, we've been talking about those stressful points and the effects on caregivers. We talked about some of the causes and the tolls that it would take if we're not careful. So we do need to be very aware of what we're doing and knowing if we have balance. So do you think you have balance, right? It's, it's, if we're using, we're gonna use the wheels on a car for an analogy, okay? When we go about town with something or we're, or we're feeling like we're out around, right? It, it can be a bumpy ride. So if we were to have a flat and we're riding 
in the car, it would feel so bumpy. And that effect, and that affects everything that the car is doing, or if you're using a bicycle, it affects everything. So if we were a car, we would feel this about our own well built being. So it's, but everyone around us, those in the service industry would be our frequently visited spots. So all of this can be affected for our full health, our wheel, for our flat tire. So it, you know, it would make it, you know, if, if, if our wheel was out around, it would make it hard to steer. It would make it bumpy and shaky, uh, making it very difficult, right? And it could even cause a wreck. And so it could even cause you not to reach your destination. How many of you have felt lost and your child was having a problem in the vehicle and you had to pull over because it was out around your at the moment life was totally out around. So we're burdened with these stressors. It's not my intention to upset anyone today, but I want to share that there is a strong body of research that has identified these burdens associated with caregiver. And I'm going to give some examples of each in the next couple. So we're going to be talking about emotional strain. We're going to be talking about health problems and we're going to be talking about financial burdens. We may have difficult behaviors that we're dealing with. Certain types of illnesses or disabilities are characterized by behavior that is not always what a parent would want to see in their child. When a child, when, when, we, as a parent, we want to be effective disciplines or correct the behavior, right? It is exasperated and it becomes chronic in nature, nature. So we do want to be careful. We have financial burdens. As a caregiver, the medical bills can quickly become too much to handle. Additional care and services for our child, extra doctor visits on top of hospitalizations. And add to it, we may already be overburdened with our household budget. So there's conflict. If we have another parent in the house, we may have difficulty um, with how we're caring for our child. We have differences of ideas how to handle and nurture the child in all aspects of their, our, their, our child's life. So some people may even deny that the problem exists. I had this in my home and that can be very difficult. So it's a struggle for both as you try to understand and accept how their relationship is evolving because of the stressors of the caregiver. So trying to find and obtain professional services for your child that can be best suited to help with your child's particular illness by understanding their abilities and limitations. Parents can be much better able to determine what support they need. School placement can be an issue. Where will the child have the best chance of becoming educated and independent? What services are offered in the schools for development and growth? Finding the school with appropriate facilities and staff can be a difficult process. So educating other family members and outsiders about our child's disability. How many times have you walked into the grocery store and had people look at you and shake their head or mumble something about your parenting abilities? This education that we provide to others is crucial for others because they may not understand exactly what our child is experiencing or how to deal with the situation. So sharing that sometimes with them can be very helpful. For us, health problems can be an issue. Higher blood pressure, insulin levels, increased threat of uh, heart disease, and compromised immune systems, mental health problems, predominantly depression. So then we have, then we have our uh, financial burdens and are worried about what does our future look like for retirement. Then here we go. We go into the time aspect of things. We really set very high expectations of ourselves. Often we become our biggest stressors. We feel though our child's success or failure depends exclusively on us because after all, we are the CEO of our family, right? We know it's best. So surely that's where it goes. And at times it feels like the clock is running out 
because we have all these pressures. Where do they need to be developmentally or medically? And we worry about the future. What does the future hold for my child? Will we be productive and will my child be productive and, uh, you know, independent individual? What will the manner that I raise him affect his final outcome? We ask a lot of questions of ourselves. And we have emotional strain. It causes such internal stressors on us. We have that self-blame. I don't know how many times I blame myself for things when things don't go the way that I thought they should be. As a parent, we may feel guilt associated with the disability or the chronic illness, especially when it's caused by genetic precursors or when it's present at birth. We wonder what degree they are that we're to blame for this illness. And we often shoulder that blame. It just feels so heavy. So when behavioral issues occur that our parents do not approve, or they may be un, we may be unable to discipline without feeling even more guilt. And I don't know about you, but that confusion and pain is very real. And what happens, especially if we don't attain that loving relationship with our child? Some illnesses and disabilities, they're not conductive to that warm and closeness that we may want to feel with our child. And we want to have this so much with our child. And so depending on what condition the child has, it may be necessary to adjust our parents, our expectations of this relationship. And how do we, how do we frame this? When we look at perception, that what are other people thinking of the parents? Are, are we the cause? Well, surely, what did we do to cause this problem? So really, is there another expression? Is that another expression of self-blame? For some parents, either consciously or subconsciously, we come to the belief that other people hold us responsible for their our child's illness. This is very rare but we still may harbor these feelings. We, it's all internal and we put this together on us. What about siblings? In my house, we had two children at a time in the house. My oldest one has had blew the coop before our time. So we may have resentment. I did in my house. Brothers and sisters of a child with chronic disability may feel neglected or angry because we're spending so much time with the other. They may feel the blame or the shame Difficult behavior, certain types of behaviors are characterized behaviors, and it's not always what we want to see in our child. And then how do we effectively discipline or correct this behavior? Or are we making this behavior worse and does it become chronic? Financial burden, we talked a little bit about. Medical bills can come quickly and be very difficult to handle. We may need additional care services for our child, doctor's visits and hospitalizations. They all add up to overburdening the household budget, right? Parent conflict, conflict between parents. Some parents have differing ideas. I don't know about you, but in our house, we were raised in two different households. So we had two different sets. How do we work with this? Sometimes there's that denial piece. So we need, it's very difficult sometimes working together. So we want to make sure that we work together to try to find answers. We need to be aware of what's going on. So you can probably think of other things that, that can be overburdening. I don't know about you, but having less less and less energy because I'm getting so worn down, worried about being the caregiver and maybe I'm not happy. I don't get any satisfaction out of this. And sleeping really doesn't seem to relieve that feeling of exhaustion. And do we have less and less social contact? And sometimes we do. The beauty of social media is sometimes we, we are really not alone. And sometimes, do I really even care? These are all questions that, you know, become an issue. So these can damage us because if we 
go untreated and we ignore these, they just fester. They sit at the bottom of our bowl. You know, the saying is you can't pour from an empty cup. We have to take care of ourselves first. I give the analogy of an airplane. I don't know how many of you have flown from an air, flown in an airplane. One of the first things they say to us when we're in the airplane is if there's a lack of oxygen, a mask will fall right in front of us. And we are to first put the oxygen mask on us and then help someone else. The reason for that is real simple. How can we help someone if we don't, are, are not able to breathe? We need to be able to help the other person. So that's why that self-care is so important. So we have symptoms of stress that can be caused when we're overburdened. We have, can have headaches, feeling of fatigue. We talked about that low energy. We can even have muscle aches and pains, tension, chest pains, that difficulty sleeping, worrying. Frequent, we can become ill frequently. We can have colds, uh, drop in our sex life, in our drive, uh, upset stomachs, diarrhea, constipation, teeth grinding. What about our mind and our mood? We're coming very easily irritated or angered. We're, we have a lot of anxiety, uh, feeling that low self-esteem. You know, it's such an inappropriate guilt, feeling overwhelmed, sadness or depression, feeling difficult sleeping, um, changes in our appetite even. That can be a problem or overeating. I know that when I'm stressed, I'll eat. Tobacco use, you smoking more because I'm stressed. The use of alcohol and drugs, nail biting, fidgeting, nervousness, procrastination, avoiding responsibilities, socially withdrawn. So stress hormones, researchers of the University of uh, Wisconsin actually found that mothers of children with autism had significantly lower levels of stress hormone cortisol compared to mothers of children without disabilities. So repeated exposure to stress over time is also known to dim diminish these hormones. So it's very important to realize that this can be very dangerous for us. And we need to recognize warning signs early so that we can, and we need to identify those sources of stress. So there are things that you can change and there are things you cannot change. So let's find some things that we can take action with. By the way, did you know that dark chocolate changes our body's response to stress? Okay, I love chocolate. I don't know too many people that don't love chocolate. So it's a very good thing to have first a snack, you know, just to, to feel re-energized. Very, very important. So there are some benefits of support caregiver groups. They reduce stress and depression, increase knowledge and skill sets. They increase coping and resiliency because you're not alone. They improve continuous care and outcomes for older adults and they help avert crisis situations and it it's also a call to care managers so the beautiful piece about it having that support being in a support group whether it's an online group or an in-person group depending on your style depending on our abilities to get out they can be very beneficial to us recognize we talked about recognizing the psych where we are and it's important to realize that grief has um a cycle and so we need to look at those stages of grief and acknowledge where we are in that stage so some of the cycle some of the cycles of grief start out with denial so at first it's our first reaction a lot of times this is just not real this is just a nightmare and then the second stage, it's that anger. Then we become angry. We may become angry at everyone. You know, um, 
it is just really very difficult. We're not sure. We get easily frustrated. We have anxieties, uh, irritations. We're embarrassed. We may even have chain, shame. <laughs> and then when we talk about um, depression and detachment, that's really our low. Because if you had, you started with that shock and denial, then we went to anger and down at the bottom. We have depression and detachment where we're overwhelmed. We have lack of energy, total helplessness. What do we do? What does it look like? We just have the blahs. We're just overwhelmed with everything. Then we look at, then we start that dialogue, right? We want to reach up. We want to reach up. We want to start reaching out to others because they are they are already there they're just like us they have similar situations we may want to tell our story because we're looking to, we're struggling to find what the meaningful purpose is what's happened here so we start bargaining right we start bargaining and then we find out that we're going and we're looking for that acceptance piece we're, we're looking at exploring our options we're looking at making a new plan we're looking at this acceptance. We want to bring this up to going from a crisis to advocacy, finding information, learning about our child's disability, understanding our child's disability, all these pieces. It's okay. And sometimes we dip back. Sometimes we jump back to being angry again. That's okay. As long as it becomes shorter and shorter periods that we stay day in the shock and denial because sometimes we find out something new and we're shocked by it then we jump and we may even skip that depression piece and go straight into advocacy and what can we do so what does it look like you know we need to figure out what's okay we need that social emotional intelligence to use it for ourselves we need to look at our physical wellness our spiritual and then are occupational so how do we define this wellness how do we find that ab abstinence in, in illness how do we find growth how do we find balance we need the social wellness we need those res uh, relationships that respect that community interaction this dimension really considers how we relate to others so how do we connect how do we communicate how do we get along with people we're surrounded by we're needing spiritual wellness. We need a meaning and values. So this dimension helps us to establish peace and harmonies in our life. It's the ability to discover meaning and purpose with life. And then we look at our emotional wellness, our feelings, our emotions, our reactions, cognition. This is where we want to touch with our feelings and our emotions. This helps us to cope with the emotional challenges of life. Occupational wellness. Interesting. We need to find skills and find finances and balance and be satisfied. We need to find that fulfillment in our job if we're working in a job and knowing that it has meaning. And, and it also has the ability to help us establish between work and leisure times. We need to promote that. We have to have both. We need to, you know, we have an intelligent wellness. We want to look at the ability to open up to new experiences and to continue growing. I continue growing every day in my job, in my home, with my children. They teach me so much every day. It's beautiful. And then we need that physical wellness. We talked about that airplane analogy. It's so important. We need this because they depend on us. So we need the body, nutrition, and health habits, which we'll get into the next um, presentation. We're going to be talking more about nutrition and health. Very, very important pieces of what we're doing. So we need to go through problem solving sometimes, right? We need to pace ourselves. We can't just re run the wheel and then we run into bumpy things. We need to pace ourselves it's not a marathon we need to reach one goal at a time
because sometimes it's so overwhelming. We have so many things going on, so many problems. So if we use a five step method to help us out and list our problems, then we can tackle them one at a time. So let's list our problems using this five step method. First step of this is what is the problem? So right now, I really want, if you're watching this live, I need you to get something out to write because I want you to list this five step method. The first step, what is the problem? The second step, what is the plan? In this piece, I want you to think of two or three possible choices and what's the result? What might happen if I do this? And then look at the list of your choices and choose one that you can do today. And remember, progress, not perfection. So that's how we start that progress. And we want to set these goals in order to help us. So let's go back through that just one more time, because I do want to make sure that this five step progress, uh, problem solving it, it is effective for you. So the first one is, what is the problem? Uh, so we need to identify the problem. The second one is identify a plan. The third one is what might happen if and the fourth one is where we write down, work that strategy, right? So where we're working that strategy. And then the fifth one is where we go back and we look at the success or the failure of what our plan has been. So this is a good measurement of how we problem solve with getting what we're needing so that you can tackle this a problem. So we do need to, while we're tackling the problem, we need to share this with others in our family. We need to share this and we may get information from other doctors. So one of the first tips that we have for today is communication, communicating all those feelings and our needs. So we want to talk with our doctors, get referrals to specialists, Talk with teachers, talk with a clergy member of your church or your synagogue or your mosque, wherever it is you're going to. If you have a support group, talk with them to get some ideas and look at some possible ways of getting mom time out or dad time out uh, to revitalize. Sharing what we did when our children were younger was we had other families that we met through support groups and we were able to actually get respite by allowing trading kids for an hour at a time because they understood our children. We understood their needs. So we were able to do that, get that help. <coughs> Excuse me. Knowing where to get help is very important. Make a list of people that you can ask for those favors. And it was really wonderful for us because I was able to um, to actually get some rest that way when I had rough nights. If I was able to call a friend and say from our play group, it's, could you help me out and come over and hang out with the kids in the house while I, I took a rest? So it was great. Um, but be really honest about what you need. We all have different needs. And we're allowing people into, you know, into our space. And I know that, you know, things can sometimes can be very difficult. And so we need, you know, to, we need to be honest. And when we allow them into our space, you know, and so, you know, going into the hospital by myself, it's really hard. And, you know, you know, when you're doing that, when you're saying that to a friend, you're giving the friend a chance to say something like, let me come with you, you know, um, it's getting hard to get to dinner, dinner on the table. Um, let me help you with that piece. So we're giving our chan, our, our friends a chance to, uh, to help us out. So in that problem solving, we can even create a list of what our needs are. Think about that. You know, how many times have you heard someone say to you, let me know if there's anything I can do. 
right? How many have how many times have you said to them, I will, and then you didn't? I'm there. People want to help and they don't know how. And so we can make a list of things that would make our lives better. And then we can share that with a friend. And then maybe they'll have the same situations. So we need to enlist that help from other caregivers. So sometimes as parents of children with special needs, we feel like we're the only ones that can handle our child. And that certainly is true to an extent, but it doesn't mean that you can't get away for a few hours. It doesn't mean that you're just stuck. Regardless of the health, we have to find ways to help us reach that balance, critical piece for us. So we want to look at tip number two. How do we stop taking meltdowns personally when our child is having a hard time? Whether you have a child who has Down syndrome, Asperger's, or a child who is on the spectrum, there's a good chance you've dealt with the meltdown. You know, it's really, really difficult. So how do we know what, what, what's the difference between that meltdown and a tantrum? Is that age appropriate? You know, how do you hold your child safely during a meltdown? You know, what do you do? This is, you know, this is identifying that your child is having a hard time. It's tough to keep, you know, your composure when this is happening and you no longer have control over your own behaviors. So try to remember that a meltdown isn't personal. Your child has lost control and you're the closest target. So remember, your child's aggression and anger isn't about his, it's, it is about his inability to deal with the situation, not about you, not about me. So once we realize it's not personal, then it's easier to cope with what's going on around us. We talked a lot about joining a community. To me, those were, that was one of the most important things that I did was finding others so that I wouldn't feel isolated because having a child with special needs can be isolating and it can be exhausting. So really and truly consider joining or creating a support group. We have workshops on supporting uh, support groups to start support groups because they look so different and they can be very valuable. I know that they are in our household. It has made life a lot easier because I know one, I'm not alone. And it gives me tips that are, have been tried by other parents. And sometimes I feel that they have my child in their home. I want to talk about this tip, uh, a financial support. Uh, it, it's really hard. Chronic illnesses and disabilities really tend to pull families apart for emotional reasons. They're also very draining on our family's budgets and resources because of that additional medical service and medications, counseling, and other constraints that progressively seem to grow over the lifetime of the disability. When researching the available, uh, you know, for financial help, we can become overwhelmed and worried. So, however, no matter where you live, there are governmental programs and private programs available to help families. We're going to be talking about some of that in some of the other PowerPoints we're going to be discussing, the workshops we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that. Um, so considering siblings is, is a big, big piece. When we have more than one child in the house, we want to make sure to nurture those relationships. It's so easy for us. We, we, so much of our energy is focused on our child with a disability. And especially with all the doctor appointments, and even if we have the best of best of situations with our two, two or three children in the household, they can still feel that we are take, we're spending so much more time. So it's really important to look for um, siblings, other other families that have children that, that have a child special needs, but have a child without special needs. 
and because they may feel slighted. So when this happens, it's not because we're a bad parent. It's just human. And our we have typical sibling rivalry as well. So try to make sure that we're able to spend some time, undivided attention with our other child in the house and engage our child uh, and talk to them about things about school projects and even try to volunteer things like making snacks for uh, their events that they're doing like for soccer or uh, for for school events, ask them so that this way they feel that they are spending special time with you. So include your child, the sibling of your child with your child with a disability, but only where it's appropriate. They may want to help sometimes. And when they don't, that's okay. Because caring, helping care for someone else in the house instills that compassion, even if it's in the youngest child. So give your children information when they want it. Some children accept their child. This is just how they are. And others want to know, why are they using a hearing aid? They may be curious about how something affects their, their brother or sister. Empower your family by accepting that this is your normal. Every family does things differently. Yours included. A child who's in a wheelchair is still your child. It's just a different way of getting around. So it's a normal for your family. This lesson teaches children acceptance and compassion and respect for others. And that people do things differently. There are times when things, when challenges arise. Empower your children by giving them and helping them brainstorm solutions with you. It's amazing what your children come up with. And usually... What's really neat, it's things we hadn't even considered. So all children should overhear you bragging about their accomplishments. Think about that. When we're having, you know, we have so many frustrations. And so they need to hear us talk about what the things that they are doing right. So many difficulties we're having. So let them hear you say that they're doing things right. And invite other families, a crucial piece is invite other families to be, to come over to play. What our norm in our home, it's okay. Invite others over to our home to play so that they see what our norm is. And at the same time, when we're doing that, remember what we talked about earlier, respite care. This is where reaching out to others is so important. We can get the support that we need through the community. Ask your community health providers. If you can't find something, ask your community health providers where you can get those extra supports because they do look differently depending on the disability of our child. Self-expression, it can really be healing and, and rejuvenating. So finding those creative outlets, you know, let's talk about things, you know, maybe it's photography or scrapbooking, music, listening to music or writing, sewing or cooking, woodworking or making jewelry, landscaping, gardening. These are all outlets and those are just a few that I'm naming. It, an outlet is something that can be simple as jotting down some notes or a few sentences, you know, it's absolutely wonderful. My husband loves to go hit balls in the backyard. Can't make it out to go golfing. So he's hitting those pieces. Okay. So these are all very good pieces to be going and doing. 